Welcome everyone, bienvenue to Arthur Richard Ford discussing his book, Dress Codes, How the Laws of Fashion Made History with our guest today, Vanessa Friedman. AFUSA is the largest Alliance Francaise network in the world, helping 25,000 learners of French each year learn French, live French, and love French. We have some wonderful national events coming up, so please mark your calendar for Cubism and the Trompe l'Oeil with Bess Griff Nessick, um, Myths and Mysteries of the Bastille with Roger Mummert, and many more coming up. So just go to the website, afusa.org. A few logistics and format. Please stay on mute during the presentation. Stay on speaker view. Please put your questions in the chat following the conversation with Vanessa and Richard. If there are technical issues, sign back in after a couple of minutes using the original Zoom link. This event is being recorded for our YouTube channel and the total runtime is one hour. So we're thrilled to introduce today, Richard Thompson Ford. Richard is a professor of law at Stanford Law School. He writes about law, social and cultural issues and race relations. He has also written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the San Francisco, San Francisco Chronicle, CNN, and Slate. Richard is the author of New York Times notable books, The Race Card and Rights Gone Wrong, How Law Corrupts the Struggle for Equality. Vanessa Friedman is fashion director and chief fashion critic for the New York Times. She is the author of Emilio Pucci. Vanessa is also the recipient of the 2018 Fashion Group International Media Award, the 2013 Fashion Monitor Journalist of the Year Award, and the 2012 Front Page Award for Fashion Writing. So before I welcome Richard and, and Vanessa, I just had a, a quick um, comment from Josette Marsh, former president of AFUSA, who was unable to jo join us and championed this event and, and connected AFUSA to Richard. So, so uh, Josette is saying from the Dordogne, bonjour tout le monde, salut from the Dordogne in France. After decades of a career as an accessories buyer, I was intrigued when Rich was a featured speaker at my club in San Francisco last year. His unique perspective on the historical importance of fashion was not only interesting, but also thought provoking on why we wear what we wear without necessarily being conscious of it being fashionable. Then when I saw the cover of his book, Dress Codes, featuring the shoes and stockings of Louis XIV with red heels that might have inspired Christian Louboutin, I was compelled to ask Richard to share his knowledge of the historic influence of French fashion with the Alliance Francaise Network. Merci mille fois, Richard and Vanessa, for what is sure to be a fascinating conversation on la mode française. So welcome, Richard. Welcome, Vanessa. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. I would love to say I'm like I'm also coming to you from the Dordogne, but <laughs> coming to you from the New York Times. <laughs> but Richard, you're, you're in California, right? I am in California. Yes, yeah, here at Stanford on campus. It's always one of my like most favorite things of of any day is to talk to Richard because when we've now been talking, it's a couple of years now. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, five or six years, because it's always thrilling to me to find someone who's a big thinker not from a fashion background who can put fashion in the context of of life and identity and politics and culture which is really what it's all about and that's really what your book is all about and why it's still such a reference point for me because it takes us like all the way back to the beginning really about how clothes really changed how people thought about life and also changed how how history developed so I want to talk to you, like, let's start a little bit at the beginning, as this applies to France. Okay. Really, Joan of Arc, right? Yes. Yes, well, Joan of Arc. Um, oh, and by the way, I should say that um, we've not only been talking for several years, but when I was researching the book, uh, Vanessa, you were kind enough to meet me and talk to me, get my, get my thinking going in the right direction with respect to this. So, you know, you were involved before the book was even written. Um, and and you know, made it um, in many ways the book that it is did it help, help me shape my thinking about fashion but um so Joan of Arc um, Joan of Arc was of course famous for her piety but also for being uh, unjustly tried for heresy and 
as part of, you know, there, there's obviously a big background with respect to the, the um, a battle over for control of France, um, but we won't get into all those details. The important part is that she was part of her heresy trial involved being um, her penchant for wearing men's clothing. And that was evidence of heresy and a violation of the biblical commandment in Deuteronomy um, that a woman shall not wear clothing that pertains to a man. Um, so there was this ancient dress code that um, she apparently violated. But the uh, a couple striking things about it was, of course, Joan of Arc was leading the French army into battle, and she wore armor, and the undergarments for armor were masculine attire. You know, there were you no know, um, other than Joan um, female. Uh, uh, knights or, or warriors. So, you know, one of her defenses was that she wore this clothing of necessity. Um, her tribunal rejected that uh, defense. But one of the uh, one of the striking things was that she also was a fashionable young woman. And I think that's one of the reasons she still resonates with um, the French today. So she's pious, she's a strong woman, but she was also a very fashionable woman. She was a sexy woman. A woman wearing men's clothing in that era was a, a real statement about the, um, you know, a, 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 about an attempt to transcend gender, um, gender norms and um, women's fashion borrowed from men's fashion in order to get sexier. So that's a, another thing that comes up in the book is the way uh, for hundreds of years, it was men's fashion that was kind of on the cutting edge, and we don't think of it as that 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 is being true today. But in Joan's time, it certainly was. So she was super fashionable because she was wearing men's clothing. Um, so you know, she also, I mean, she was someone who was a leader, right? And she sort of understood the like what it took to to rally people around, to you know, take them somewhere. And part of that is creating, you know, sort of exciting image making right it's it's creating the persona of somebody that people want to follow that people want to believe in and a lot of that is actually presentation right it's clothing yeah. it's how you appear so if you talk a little bit about that yeah no absolutely so she um she kind of followed in a tradition of uh a, a, a literary tradition of heroic female um female characters who uh, used who would wear men's clothing, you know, in order to take on some great um, feat. And so that, you know, already there's a symbolism that was going to be readable by people there of this young woman who's adopting male attire to do something important, you know, to follow God's will. And she indeed, you know, rallied troops. She convinced leaders that she could um, lead them out of difficult situations. And yet yeah, image was a huge part of that, uh, um, just as image was a huge part of statecraft at that time in history. So uh, she was in that sense, you know, an early fashion pioneer, but also an early kind of political pioneer. I mean, it's funny to me now because I, you know, I write about a lot about what modern day politicians wear, yeah. whether it's, you know, Macron or the Bidens or, you um, or Johnson or whoever, and you know, almost inevitably, when that happens, I'll get pushback from some readers who think it's kind of superficial to be thinking about clothing, and then like this is some sort of, you know, example of the the way that like social media has decayed the okay. substance of, <laughs> of modern life. And you know, I'm always like, this is not new. Nope. You know, like this has been going on since Cleopatra, like time immemorial. You know, people in the public eye have always understood how to use their appearance and their image to manipulate opinion to their own ends, right? And that's true, not just of Joan, but of like numerous other, you know, examples in French history, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, the, I mean, well, I think you could argue that image was perhaps more important in these earlier eras, even than it is today, because although with today you have social media and all of this proliferation of images, um, at that period of time, a lot of the population's illiterate. So everything's being communicated through spectacle and image. Uh, the right to rule is needs to be reflected in the royal person. And uh, you know, absolutely the French were kind of pioneers with respect to that. Where you, when you look at um, leaders like Louis XIV, you know, they, he, you know, a very carefully crafted image that wasn't about um, self-indulgence, but was about power. Uh, and I, I, absolutely that's still true today. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, people look now, they look at those portraits and they're like, oh, frill, you know, lace and frills and sort of, and they said that somehow equals like less important or less serious when in fact it's actually the exact opposite, right? Like each one of those kind of seemingly decorative elements had meaning. Yes, absolutely. So um, right, quite, quite the opposite. The, the adornment was a way of signifying power and the right to rule and status. There were rules about this. So one of the things I write about in the book is just how many laws and rules that were regulating who could wear what. So if the monarch was exhibiting their um, you know, divine right in part through their wardrobe, it was very important that commoners and other people didn't wear similar clothing. So they had a lot of rules about it. They took it very, very seriously. And masculine style, since most of the leaders were men, was more elaborate, more adorned, you know, with more jewels and brocade and all the rest of it than feminine styles for many hundreds of years. I mean, really until the mid 1700s, uh, that was true. And no one thought that it was superficial or frivolous. This idea that fashion is frivolous is really quite recent. Where do you think it comes from? Well, there's a moment in uh, and I think we here we can blame the British um, and not the French, uh, but there's there's a moment and it, it's actually a, 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 a commentator called it the great masculine renunciation. And it's a moment when men start to get rid of the finery, the brocade, the jewels, the ceremonial swords, all the rest of it and wear kind of streamlined clothing. And I think it's fair to say that this starts or really gets um, formed in England, it's after the execution of Charles I, so their absolute monarch, who in many ways styled his clothing and image on uh, Louis XIV. You know, he looked across the channel and thought, yeah, that's, that's power, that's what I want. Um, but he was executed and- um, <laughs> so Maybe that's not out. what he wanted. <laughs> no, that was not what he wanted. So it didn't, that didn't work out for him in England. And um, the, the royal court where people would wear all of this fine clothing kind of fell apart or at least became much less important. The men started wearing streamlined clothing that, now it was another kind of status symbol. You know, I mean, I don't want to suggest that this wasn't about status too, but it was a new way of signifying status. And that was through looking practical and maybe looking like you'd just come off your country estate, but also streamlined. And so um, that then became the symbol of male power and fashion started to be associated with women and therefore with you know, the frivolous and the, the, the flighty and the whimsical. Right, I mean, it's, it, clothing really has always been used as a kind of way to demarcate class, social group, caste, right? I mean, I remember I was just talking to someone about, you know, graduations and why people wear caps and gowns. And they said, well, you know, it's, it all goes back to the sort of medieval universities, mm -hmm. which were created to educate clergymen, right? So they wore the sort of robes of the clergy that they would become, which also distinguished them from the people in the town who were just sort of workers. Right, um, town and, gown. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> town and gown. Um, so I'm sort of fascinated by that and by, you know, what does equal sort of elitism and power and how that's changed. Right. Yeah. So it, with, with the gowns, it's interesting that in, uh, in, in the medieval period and earlier, men and women both wore draped clothing. And so these gowns were, in a sense, just a holdover from ancient status symbols and these older profession scholars, um, the clergy, as you say, judges or wore, you know, continued to wear this draped clothing, but the other men, men in particular, were wearing um, tailored clothing. So tailoring comes in. Um, the women are still draped at least below the waist. And so that's another, um, another demarcation. But, um, you know, the use of clothing, because you were asking about the use of clothing to signify status. Um, one thing that happens, there's a moment that some historians describe as the birth of fashion in the late 1300s. And, tailoring becomes widespread, at least among, you know, fairly well off people, not just aristocrats, but also pretty quickly wealthy merchants, skilled tradespeople that have some money to spend. Um, it's expensive, but you can create 
new forms with the art of tailoring that weren't possible with draped clothing. And that becomes a way, again, of signifying power. You know, Queen Elizabeth was a great example in England of, you know, someone who used this um, power of tailoring early on to signify status. But, um, you know, again, I think the French really took it to its most refined and um, you know, most effective use, all of the ways in which clothing could signify social status. And again, had a lot of rules about it. So, you know, in King, um, in, in Louis the Fourteenth's the court, um, only members of the high court could wear shoes with red heels among other yeah, yeah. Well, Let's um, talk about the red. Let's talk about the red because there's red today. So what, what did that mean? And where well, did it come from? Yeah, so the red. There were two things that happened with the with with shoes. What well, I mean, red had long been a symbol of status, be, simply because it's expensive. It's hard. It was hard to manufacture red dye at that time. Um, but the high heeled shoes had a really unusual or kind of surprising trajectory, where they started off as the footwear for um, Persian equestrians, and these Persian soldiers you know, came into Europe and you know, they were super sexy. They were military, they were martial, they were tough, they were exotic. They had their high heeled shoes, which they used to you know, fit into the stirrups of the horse. Um, so functional, practical shoes, but also of course they were very flamboyant um, and everyone wanted to look like them. And so all the men started wearing high heeled shoes. And as things happen in fashion, that symbolism kind of became detached over time from the function and the heels themselves become a status symbol, and then they need to get higher and higher, you know, in order to stand out and be, and then maybe painting them red is also not only makes them stand out more, but also red is independently a high status dye. And, you know, you can imagine what this signifies, like red as a high status dye that very few people can afford to wear anywhere, but I'm going to wear it on my shoes. Um, that, that's a flex, I think. So do you think that Christian Louboutin knows about all this? Oh, I can't, I must. I, I can't imagine that he didn't see this portrait. And it's, a, it's the portrait that's on the cover of the book, um, and, but it's a very famous portrait. It hangs in the Louvre. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I just, I've got to believe he saw that portrait and thought, I've got my, I've got my symbol. Um, and now of course it's protected with trademarks and everything else. I mean, it's interesting, too, to look at that picture and remember that, like, men wore tights, right? Like, men wore bloomers, like, the, all those sort of markers of gender that we now think of, for, like, cliches of gender completely flipped. Right, right, exactly. So all of these things were masculine attire. It's one of the reasons I love that image for the cover of the book, because it conveyed not only status and power, but also sex. And so a modern reader might look at that and think, you know, is that a man or a woman? Um, stockings, high heels, seems feminine. But at the time, all of that was the height of masculine uh, power and masculine is, images. It's also interesting because it sort of shows you how clothing was used to control the body, right? Which has always been a sort of source of tension and debate and concern amongst all kinds of groups, right? Because of what it says about you know, desires and carnality and sort of a sort of messiness of life. And, yeah. you know, I think what's interesting is that you connect that to like to the law, right? It's not just corsetry, it's actual like restrictions on what you can and can't wear. Yes, yes. And so that um, there, masculine clothing not only provided um, or signified freedom, but also it provided a certain bodily freedom that, that, that feminine clothing didn't, the draped clothing below the waist that had lots of symbolism, but also some practical constraints. And it's true that the constraint of the body was um, not a bug, but a feature. And people would write about it that, you know, people needed the corset and for a long time corsets were worn by men and women, but, you know, the corset provided not only support for the internal organs, but also, you know, a, a um, kind of psychological support for good moral values. And there was a huge concern that when women in particular were going to stop wearing their corsets that, you know, that would, of course, the loosening of the corset would lead to the loosening of their moral values and their, the, the, feeling of freedom in their bodies that would be bad for society. That might in fact lead to a revolution. Right, that might really lead to a revolution. Exactly, not only, um, 
the, a, a revolution, political revolution um, in France. And so you see the connection between changes in clothing and politics, um, but you know, also of course, gender or sexual revolution um, in, in later periods. And a fashion revolution, right? Because that was the, I mean, they're, like clothing again was so intertwined with the symbolism of the revolution and, and class and caste and all of that. Right, right, exactly. So you have, um, oh, the, the, the sound culo, um, and the, oh, what was the incroyable. So there were these two groups that were, you know, named in uh, French society around the time of the revolution. And the sound culo, of course, were uh, without the um, knee breeches uh, and, and that were symbols of the aristocracy. They were wearing long pants, solidarity with the working class. Um, and it, the, the symbolism was so clear that um, Thomas Jefferson adopted essentially the sans culotte style and brought it to the United States as appropriate for, um, you know, a, a, a nation founded as a Republican form of government. But this was seen as, you know, getting away from aristocracy. And, you know, the term silk stocking it comes from the old hidebound uh, aristocratic style. Yeah, I think it's fascinating how so many of these these periods in history, these moments and these groups actually get known by the clothes, names of the clothes they wear. Yeah. Right? It's almost like this shorthand that we all share. Right, right. And so while at the one, on the one hand, people are imagining that fashion is superficial, this kind of contemporary idea, at the same time, we're referring to it constantly in order to explain social divisions, political divisions, all sorts of things. It's very telling. Right, value systems, who we are, right, who we relate to, what our communities are, because yeah. it's one of those things, right, fashion is clothes are one of the few things that everybody shares, right, and it's the kind of language that everybody speaks, even if you don't speak the same language. Right, right, it's visible, it's visceral, it transforms the body, and so there's something that's just so much more immediate about that, where wearing a particular type of garment really is saying, this is who I am. Uh, it's it's that kind of direct statement and everyone understands that. I think that's why changes in, for instance, gender norms around clothing are so um, threatening to some people because there really is a, the way we understand who someone is is by what they're wearing. And when people challenge that, they're challenging potentially everything about the way people organize society. Well, I mean, that's what's so good about your title, right? Dress codes. So that's like so many potential meanings to that because like, we all have like, you know, the Times has a sort of a dress code. You know, I went to schools that had dress codes. There's dress codes in Congress. And yet there are also all these coded meanings within those dress codes, right? And there's this always this tension that exists between individuals, right? And who you are and how what you want to say to the world about who you are through your clothes and the institutions that you're aligned with and how they think about clothing. Right, right. And one of the things, uh, you know, I, one of the reasons I got started on this project was because there's so many lawsuits and legal disputes around clothing and dress codes. And the, but the, 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 the inclination of the judges would be to say, well, this is all superficial. Um, but if it's all superficial, why is everyone fighting over it? And of course, uh, there, so on the one hand, you just have the dress code, uh, as you say, you know, here's, here's the dress code. Um, men must wear jackets and ties. Uh, women must wear nylons and, and, and high heels. But what is, and one way of thinking about that is, oh, well, whatever, who cares? Um, just comply with the dress code if you want the job. But, well, um, the, when you start to think about the other sense of dress codes, what does this mean? Um, what does it mean that women must wear um, you know, skirts and nylons to be considered professional? There's a lot built into that. Um, and maybe that's what the women are protesting when they're resisting the dress code. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me how much of what you have talked, you know, what we just, we've just talked about in the last sort of 15 minutes is still kind of relevant subjects today. You know, yeah. it's like you go from the sand culotte to the yellow vest. Right, yes. You sort of parallel movements and you know and we're in a time now when there's so many divisions you know people are expressing themselves as sort of oppositional forces through what they're wearing so many questions about who controls whose body which then gets like expressed in the dress code i wonder if you talk a little bit about those parallels like what you saw in doing the book and some of your research and what you see now 
Yes, no, it's really true that they're, uh, they, they, I love the, the yellow vest. So uh, you can talk about how much is built into that kind of symbol of the proletariat, you know, who wears yellow vests and, you know, and the, but also it's very striking, uh, you know, right away, uh, it's it's um, going to show up well on a um, on, on an Instagram posting or, or something along those lines. But we see it everywhere, um, you know. And throughout history, dress codes have been a way for social movements to express their values, to express their ideals, to send messages that it may be hard or impossible to send in other ways. Um, the civil rights movement in the United States had a dress code. People, you know, wore their Sunday best to protest against segregation. They wore their Sunday best to integrate lunch counters. Um, you know, this was a time when they were going to be attacked by racist mobs. Police dogs would be set loose on them. Uh, this, but but that symbolism was important to them. Uh, and you see it. Um, you even see it in some of the more contemporary social movements. And you're thinking about the. Um, Oh, when Donald Trump was elected president and all the women wore the pink pussy hats, um, you know, turned into a, 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 a powerful symbol. But it's not just social movements, is it? It's also day to day, the things that people uh, decide to wear and some of the struggles that we're having now, whether it's around gendered clothing or um, what people should wear when they're going back to work after COVID, is it okay to wear sweats to the office? Um, or not, there's a lot built into these um, to, to these clothing choices. And at some visceral level, I think everyone understands that even when they sometimes think, it, you know, try to deny it or say it's superficial. I mean, I remember it was, it was a couple of years ago, maybe even 10 years ago now, something like that. You know, do you remember this when um, Cécile Duflo, who I think was a minister in the French parliament, you know, got up and she was wearing a, a floral shirt dress and she got cat called by her fellow mm -hmm. well, legislators who were like, you know, oh, a woman in a kind of provocative, wasn't very provocative, but like, you know, not in a suit. Right. In Is government. It? And I thought, you know, that was a really striking moment. And I wonder if that, you know, would still happen today, if we've gotten improved at all in this way or not. Yeah, it's a good question because we did you know, just recently there was a big fight over women, um, the requirement that women in the U.S. Congress have, you know, um, their shoulders covered. And, you know, there these regulations, you know, what can be revealed, what can be um, uh, not, what must be covered are, you know, there's a lot of built into that in terms of the control of bodies, in terms of what kinds of bodies belong in a particular place. And so I, you know, I think a woman wearing a um, bright floral dress instead of wearing something that um, you know, tries to walk the line between a traditional masculine attire and feminine attire, which had been the, you know, the longstanding norm, you know, is kind of a statement and maybe a threatening one that, you know, no, the point is women aren't, it's not strange that women are here. It's not, that women are here, but they need to look as much like men as possible. It's like, no, women are here too. Um, and feminine garments are appropriate as business attire. That's a, um, you know, a statement that obviously some people um, didn't take well. Well, I think, I mean, certainly now as we see a kind of swing in a lot of countries back to, you know, to the right, mm -hmm. to more kind of conservative, movements and value systems, you know, one of the ways that's often expressed is in renewed calls for dress codes. And, yes. you know, with what I would think of as more old fashioned dress codes. I mean, you know, as you said, like in the US Congress now, you know, first in the House of Representatives, they officially made it possible for women to wear sleeveless tops in 2017, I think, like during a big heat wave, you know, the uh, Senate only changed their rules, I think, in around like 2020, maybe was when Kristen Cinema was elected. Right because she liked to go sleeveless and Amy Klobuchar was on the like the Senate Rules Committee and was like, come on guys, this woman does not like to wear like suits. You gotta make her feel at home. We're gonna get rid of this old idea. And so they did, but now you have all these state houses like Florida and I think Missouri, you know, which have reinstituted very kind of time bound dress codes where women have to wear either cardigans or jackets they have to wear skirts below the knee you know i mean it's like it's very old-fashioned and i'm sort of fascinated by that shift 
And I wonder if you see it in other places. Yes, I, I do. And, you know, it reflects, I guess, historically, the rules around gendered attire were very much tied up with the changes uh, you, 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 with, with, with the way that um, professional attire and civic virtue was symbolized by masculine attire. And so there was very much, um, you know, early on, of course, it was just a flat out prohibition of women in many of these professions. Uh, but when that started to give way, still, the idea was that the women had to kind of, um, uh, you know, thread this needle where, uh, you know, you couldn't wear masculine clothing because that would be, you know, cross-dressing and obviously provocative and, and not okay. But you also couldn't wear traditional feminine clothing because everything about feminine clothing symbolized the opposite of civic virtue. Um, so there's this, 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 um, this tight uh, um, thing to be negotiated. Um, and going back to that is, you know, has to be a way of ensuring that women are less comfortable or put in their place um, with respect to positions of power and civic freedom. So I do think that the symbolism there is important and that it's related to a lot of other changes we're seeing in some societies. I mean, what's interesting if you look at France is that, you know, the kind of the, the right wing figure on the rise, right, is Marine Le Pen, which mm -hmm. is a woman. And, right. you know, I think what she, yet yeah, what she represents is, you know, not that kind of liberated dress code, but yeah. a very different kind of code. And in fact, you know, when we look at what's happening now, I think there's a lot of symbolism going on around the fashion industry in France, particularly, you know, when it comes to the politics of retirement and wealth and lifestyle, right? Because fashion is so much a part of the French lifestyle yes. and patrimony because of Joan of Arc, because of Louis XIV, because of all the traditions you mm -hmm. talked about in a way that it isn't, I think, as overtly embraced or discussed, you know, in countries like the US or or even, I mean, maybe a little more in the UK because of their Savile Row tradition, which is kind of part of their national identity. Right. Um, you know, but I think in, in France in particular, you know, dress and the creation of dress is so much a part of how, you know, how they think of themselves. Yes. Yes, no, I think that that's absolutely right. That that um, it's oh, it's it's recognized and um, it's overt and it's done uh, because it it is. It's done in a way that's much more, um, I much more deliberate and you know. And then uh, for that reason, in many ways, much more sophisticated uh, and than you know. That I mean, I'd say the stereotypical American, but. Um, it's more widespread. And so that's, um, I'm interested what, you know, in, in what you think about the relationship between that and, and the fashion industry in particular, you know, and, and what's going on in France today, because some people are saying, you know, oh, I went to Paris and, you know, now they're all dressing like Americans, uh, which I was not my experience when I was in Paris, but I get, you know, that things are, styles are relaxing even in France. I don't, I don't know. I think if you look at the reaction to Emily in Paris, <laughs> people right. in Paris, I think no one is drawing dressed like that kind of American. Um, <laughs> in fact, I actually I got, a, I got a reader question once about like, how do you, what's the best way to stick out as a tourist in France? And everyone was like, dress like Emily. Either dress like <laughs> Emily or, or wear like a lot of leggings. Like leggings are just like not, not quite the same. Right. But, um, you know, I, I do think it's really, notable that you know the current richest man in the world is french and right. made his made his empire you know built his fortune off fashion and luxury and you know that that actually from where i sit has sort of provoked a lot of surprise and i'm always like why are you surprised like right. this is an absolute like worldwide industry that is perennially healthy because what it taps into you know these ideas of creativity, of beauty, of class, of status, of aspiration. You know, these are like eternal, right? Yeah. They've never not existed. Doesn't matter how many bad, how much bad stuff is happening around them in the world. But yet at the same time, it's also made Arnaud a target, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly in France. And we saw that mm -hmm. 
like a week and a half ago when you know the, the protesters who were upset about the retirement age changing actually stormed the headquarters of LVMH with you know with flares mm -hmm. and um you know, that was a really striking image to me right wow right right so he's um that, uh, that it's a few things are going through my mind I mean one is the way that in France there's such a tradition of um almost romanticizing social protest. So in a way that's never been true in the United States, we've had lots of social protests, but I'm thinking of an Adam Gopnik um, article about this, where you know, there's a, almost a romance for 1968. And so these protests have a, um, I don't know, they, they, I think they captivate the imagination in a way that is quite different than in the United States. But then the, that coming up against, um, you know, another very French institution, the fashion industry, and then seeing him as a symbol of what's wrong in France, you know, the maldistribution of wealth and um, and the, the, the focus on luxury as opposed to basic needs, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's funny to me though, because I sort of, I feel like at the same time, you know, he's, he will say, I employ, X hundreds right. of thousands of people, right? You know, I have factories everywhere. I've preserved all this know-how. I pay all this tax. <laughs> right, right. And it, it is interesting. I wonder whether the, you know, you said people were surprised. So, you know, now he's dethroned Elon Musk as the wealthiest person in the world. And, you know, whether the fact that so much of the fashion industry is um, associated with luxury, you know, some fairly or unfairly, um, makes him a bigger target because, you, you know, as opposed to something that people think of as more, um, something that people think of as more uh, egalitarian in terms of who it serves. Uh, I'm, I'm course, sure that's true. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. That's true. I mean, sure whether that's this is fair or not, that there's that, that, um, that belief. And yet, I mean, you get Brigitte Macron, who almost entirely wears Louis Vuitton during mm -hmm. public events, you know, who has very much sort of allied herself with with the brand, you know, with what it represents in terms of French excellence, I think, and, um, you know, and, and with Arnaud and his power base. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's quite a also potential contrast with Marine Le Pen. And it was kind of setting up this, this sort mm -hmm. of thing. Right, so she's setting herself up in this, in this kind of um, faux everyman position as opposed to the elite, which is always a way for populists to, um, to market themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I would say it's another form of marketing and all back to image. And Yeah, and then so, I mean, I'm gonna ask you like a final question and then we're gonna open this up. So you guys, okay. everyone who's listening on the call should start like, <laughs> scribbling down or typing in typing in your questions so that we can read through them but like i want to go back to how you first got into all of this okay. because it isn't i've got to say like i haven't met a lot of law professors <laughs> yes. who've written books on fashion so what was it that sort of rang the bell in your mind and made you think this is an actual relevant subject for me and one that in fact like intersects with my area of study in really meaningful ways Yes, well, I mean, well, so there are two things. I mean, one, uh, there were a lot of, there's a lot of litigation around dress codes. And I teach employment discrimination, among other things, because I think it's one of the most important areas where our civil rights ideals are actually getting I implemented in people's day to day lives. You know, I mean, everyone cares about keeping their jobs and the like. But lots of dress codes um, and disputes around that. And I never thought the courts did a very good job of describing what was at stake. They tended to say it was superficial, um, which struck me as a bad way to get started in making a good decision about something. Because um, you know, if you start by saying it doesn't matter. The other thing, I, I've, I've always been kind of interested in fashion. And I guess I got that from my father, who was um, a well-dressed man. He cared a lot. He trained as a tailor. Um, he went to a uh, historically black college and in his college, everyone learned a trade as well as a profession um, because this was at a time when um, segregation and racism might keep African-Americans from their chosen profession. So you, you'll have something to fall back on. You know, every, you'll always be able to eat if you're a good tailor. So, but he knew about clothing. And, um, but he also cared about it for 
his professional career in which he was quite successful, um, it was it was very clear to me that it mattered uh, that the wearing the suit and the jacket and having it be the right um, thing and refined and elegant was important to him as a way of navigating what could be a difficult racial atmosphere. And he was often the first African American in fields where he worked. So I saw how important that was early on. That you know, this isn't trivial and it's not superficial. And you know he understands that, and he kind of set um, uh, a, you know an example for me. And so moving forward, I, I wanted to explore all of the aspects of that because, of course, there's also you know just pride and joy and fun. I don't want to leave that out. Um, you know, it's not all just politics and power. But um, those things are fused. And I think that's what makes fashion so interesting is that they're fused together. Yes, people do it because they love it and it's fun. And it's, um, you know, it expresses who they are as individuals. But that's tied up with power and status and, and politics. And so how did your colleagues react when you told them you were doing the book? Well, you know, at first they just kind of thought, well, hmm, all right, you have tenure, you know. <laughs> but... Um, after I gave a couple talks about the book, you know, it was interesting. I would kind of split the room, which I think is you often a sign that you're doing something right. Um, so, you know, some half the people would go, "Oh, wow, yeah, I get it," and you know, another half would be some mad. You know, I mean, actually, some angry reactions. You know, um, which I thought, good, okay, I've hit, I've hit a nerve. Um, let's keep trying to 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 go in this direction. Um, and now I think most people get the project. They may not agree with every aspect of it, but they, you know, they know why it's important. All right. And has it, did any of them change how they dressed around you afterwards? And did you change how you dressed? Uh, um, I think I felt I was under a bit more of a microscope. So I had to, you know, live up to, because if I ever showed up wearing something slouchy, they'd be like, oh, you know, Mr. Dress Codes. Is your, um, but... <laughs> But they claimed to do this, but I don't think they did, except a couple, when I gave a talk about it, they said, well, today I had to wear my best jacket or you know, my best dress or something like that. Yeah, yeah that's going to follow you for the rest of your life. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. All right, so should we take some questions? Sure. Uh, Let's see. Do you guys want to feed them to us? Yeah, or? yeah I don't mm -hmm. see them. Uh, friends, go, go ahead, ahead, go ahead, Melissa. Huh. Uh, Francisco had a comment. He said, although it's clear to me that styles of women have historically been policed more than men's, I'm curious about what you think of male professional attire in more recent history. You discussed the change allowing women to go sleeveless in Congress. However, I think men still have to wear jackets. What to make of this dynamic? Oh, yeah. That's an interesting one. Um, I mean, men's, I think there's a way in which the band, um, the Men have less um, flexibility in what they can wear. So although women have to wa walk this kind of tightrope um, in many professional circumstances, for men, there's a very clear idea of what, it ca what counts as professional male attire. And departing from that is just not acceptable. So it's easy. You, you know what to do. But you really do have to do it in a lot of circumstances. And, and, and that, I think, is tied up with you know, in a way, kind of policing the ideal of masculinity. You know, this is what it means to be a man, and it's important that we all uphold that. I mean, I would also say that the flip side of the sort of annoyance of dress codes and the restraints of de dress codes is the safety of dress codes. Yes. And if everyone knows how they're supposed to dress in the morning and they all kind of look the same, then you don't feel like you're sticking out or making mistakes and you're not worried about it. And I feel like this because men have less options, they often resort to the safety of the dress code. You know, women are used to juggling all these issues and sort of ideas of like, okay, what am I going to wear this morning? And how is that going to be, you know, taken and la da, da, da. And I think men are just like, I put on my suit and I go to work and I am like, I look appropriate. And then I can worry about this other stuff. And I would think that like, actually a lot of the reason that the male dress code in Congress hasn't changed is because they haven't felt a need or a desire to change it. And in fact, you know, everyone doesn't, I mean, Jim Jordan is endlessly taking off his jacket and rolling up his shirt sleeves because he wants the world to think he's ready to fight. I mean, he's, he's said that on tape, like he's, you know, he's a former boxer or wrestler and he just like, he wants, he's like ready for a fight. And, you know, <laughs> characteristically, traditionally when presidents want to show that they're working hard, 
Mm -hmm. And they're sort of at their desk, they take off their jackets, they roll up their sleeves, right? It's, it's a kind of costuming trope. So I think actually like the suit is still around because really the people who wear suits like them. Yeah, that's great. I mean, even in professions where they've kind of relaxed, the men gravitate toward a new dress code, even if it's not imposed. You know, there's an Instagram site called the Midtown Uniform, right. and it's about these you know investment bankers who don't have to wear a suit, but they all still wear exactly the same outfit with a Patagonia fleece and a button-down collar shirt um, because it's safe and it's easy. Uh, yeah. All right, we have another question from Alexa Rice. What do you think of the rising costs of luxury goods, especially as a lot of current trends are geared towards street style, high-end sneakers, athletic brands like Supreme, et cetera, a style that I personally would not consider to be expensive. Why do clothes that do not cost a lot of money to produce seem to be getting more expensive? I imagine it's because luxury houses can sell it and people keep buying it. But I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for, for a wonderful talk. Hmm. I, I mean, I have one thought about this, which is in the history of fashion, it's been true for a very long time that clothing that started off as functional, either workwear or sportswear, later became luxury wear. So that's just part of a trend. You know, I mean, the sports coat was a sports coat at one time um, for hunting or for um, tennis. And um, you know, and then as it becomes a luxurious, it gets made with nicer cloth. There's more care put into tailoring. It gets expensive. So I think we might just be seeing something like that going on with streetwear now that it's become something that's kind of high status. Yeah, I mean, just because something is associated with less expensive habits doesn't mean that the actual product is itself a kind of cheap product. Hmm. Right. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of talk right now about stealth wealth and, you know, quiet luxury and essentially like a lot of cashmere hoodies, right? And, you know, stuff <laughs> is like like the sort of the, the forms of what we might think of as, you know, sort of basic street stuff, but actually is made out of very expensive materials. So it's harder to know what is costly and what is not. And, you know, well, on the one hand, like I, I am like shocked by the prices of some luxury goods. I mean, spending $10,000 for a handbag does sort of make my head explode. You know, on the other hand, I think it's really important that we all like rethink the calculus of how much clothing, like of, of what goes into clothing and what its value is and how much you want to keep it around. That, you know, we have become way too accustomed to the idea of disposability when it comes to clothes and that things should change and turn over all the time. And so if you, when you spend more on something, you tend to value it more and keep it longer. And if that's the behavior that these kind of price increases are driving, honestly, I'm all for it. Yeah, that's a really great point because it, you know, historically clothing was very expensive and it was a big investment and it, it required a lot of thought for most people. And it's only been quite recently that you've gotten this mass production that allows clothing to be cheap and people expect everything to be $10 or $20 at Target. Um, but that kind of clothing is, you know, it's terrible for the environment. It's not sustainable. It's usually made with, you know, child labor or labor that's not fairly compensated. You know, those are, those are the cost of cheap stuff. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with you entirely. Like, I think people used to really think hard, like, you know, because clothing was a symbol of achievement or aspiration and where you wanted to get to. And, you know, it was people saved for it and then they valued it and then they took care of it and then they passed it down. You know, it became these kind of totems, these symbols of, you know, advancement. And we kind of lost that a little bit and it's yeah. not necessarily been uh and a you know a good thing thank you uh, rita would like to know um your comments on the met gala and the coronation mm -hmm. any comments <laughs> oh but please vanessa you start with that one um <laughs> I mean, those are two pretty big subjects, but I think they are both rituals. They're sort of modern rituals that put um, the symbolism of clothing front and center, right? Because they are moments, these shared moments where we're all looking at the same pictures. There are no real words attached to them. There's no explanation necessarily. We're just staring at this imagery 
that is communicating all sorts of things in both cases about, again, about class and status and, you know, and history and values. Um, they're just kind of two different, two different things. Yeah. I mean, in a way, the Met Gala and things like it really are our version of a royal pageantry. So it's striking that they both happen so close in time to each other, so you could really see that. But, um, you know, what the closest thing you've got to an American aristocracy are the people who get invited to the Met Gala, and they wear this, you know, it's a, one of the circumstances where people are wearing something very close to ceremonial attire. It's not a tire that you wear every day or anything even close to it. It's designed to be seen for that night. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's an interesting, you know, comparing that to fashionable clothing that people wear every day is an interesting thing. Yeah, and it's funny because people are often like, God, it looks like costume, which of course it is. I mean, it's literally for the Costume Institute. Yeah. It's, like, right. it's a costume yes. party. And in fact, it like, it, it points up the very thin line between like Halloween costume and everyday costume. Right. Um, you know, but it is it is a kind of costume that denotes, you know, our, as you said, like our place in society, who's in, who's out. And, you know, what is interesting about the Met is it is this mix of, you know, sports, like high achieving people in sports and politics and business and celebrity and influencers now. And they're all kind of put together in this mix, which is very, like both elitist and democratic at the same time. Yeah, yeah that's great. We have another question about your opinion on Kentucky Derby hats. Oh. Uh, you got it, Rich, you got to do this one because that's like symbolism, like historical symbolism up the wazoo. Well, right, right. So the big hats, it, it, it strikes me, there is again a connection with um, with the coronation, you know, where, where large, you know, elaborate ladies hats are important and I believe, um, oh, it's no, it's, the, it's, it, it's an ascot where the women are required to wear hats and you know, no fascinators. So you know, it has to be a, a proper hat. So that is uh, the, the requirement that ladies cover their heads is, you know, in, now it's, it, it's anachronistic, but it was a longstanding requirement in, in a variety of ways. And then the elaborateness around that, the hat, which I mean, now I'm kind of also thinking about the black church and the way in certain um, African-American churches, the women would wear the hats to church. And they, you know, it was really quite a, a pageant of these you know, very elaborate, very um, carefully planned hats. So if there's something, um, there, there's a through line with all of those. It's ceremonial. It's um, a symbol of a particular type of, oh, I'm looking for the right word, because spectacle's not quite the right, the word I'm looking for, but, um, yeah, but a certain type of performative femininity, I guess that's, that's it. Melissa, do you see any other questions in the chat? No, I think we've covered everything. Okay, I just had one last, one question. Uh, you you both speak about, or I think it was it was Richard that spoke about fashion as a sort of carefully crafted image. I don't know if anyone in this audience has spent any time in Manhattan, not at the Met Gala, obviously. <laughs> the way people are dressing right now is 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 really kind of sad. I mean, you go into New York and you see everybody in a pair of tights and a sort of a crummy looking Patagonia. Whereas if you're in Paris, you still have a little, there's a little bit more definition. I mean, do you see post COVID that, that we're gonna be, we are gonna maybe perhaps as Americans be less sloppy and be more carefully crafted and and um, and be more back, you know, back to maybe pre COVID fashion in wonderful, in big cities at least. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the definition the definition of carefully crafted is generational often and and community based. And one group's carefully crafted is another group's very sloppy. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, I think everyone's trying to figure out what their lives look like post COVID. And, I, and in some ways, we're not really post COVID. We're kind of still in the mushy, mushy after effects. Um, so I think that's what you're seeing is this kind of uncertainty and that's informed by what's happening politically, by war, by economic uncertainty, by, you know, all this stuff that really people just don't know quite what's about to happen, where they can spend their money. Um, and you see that in this kind of uncertainty around how they should 
express themselves and what they should wear. So to me, that's sort of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, that, I think that that's good. That's really right because um, you've got, some of this is people are coming off of work on Zoom and then like, is that workwear now? Uh, what I wore when I was on my couch on Zoom and at least we're out here in California, a lot of people are taking the attitude. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm now I'm working from home four days a week or three days a week and then I'm in the office too. I'm just, just gonna wear the same thing. Uh, but other people aren't and there's a lot of kind of confusion. It's just not clear what's expected or what's required. I'm finding in, occasionally people are really dressing up at night. So you almost have this inversion where in my leisure time I dress up because it's fun and because it's finally I can go out and do things and, you know, um, but for work, why bother? And it's, it's not, none of it's really helped by the fact that because employers are so afraid of contravening laws now with dress codes, everyone has resorted to the like appropriate, dress appropriate, and who the hell knows what appropriate means? No. <laughs> it means something different to everybody. Right. Oh, that's that's really true. So the safety of the dress code has been taken away. And um, it's interesting you brought it back to law because it's really true that for employers, they're worried about offending, you know, either doing something that's flat out illegal, like, can I have a different dress code for men and women? Historically, the answer was yes. Now, maybe people aren't so sure. Um, you might offend the wrong person. What about people that are not your know, gender non-binary? How do you, you know, how does your dress code affect them? Um, it, similar things involving race, you know, can I, what about a hair, you know, style? Um, what should I say? And so there's a reticence, which is in many ways a good thing. You know, I mean, it's appropriate, but people are trying to figure out, well, what is the appropriate norm now, given that these things are, 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 are kind of in flux or yeah, contested? Maybe like five years ago, the New York City Committee on or the Commission on Human Rights was asked to reinterpret the law as it applied to dress codes, you know, particularly for like restaurants where, you know, like men had to wear trousers and women had to wear heels. And what they decided was that employers could specify dress however they wanted, but that both genders had to have, it had to apply equally to both genders. So if you're going to require heels, everyone had to wear heels. <laughs> or women. If you're going to acquire pants, everyone had at least had the option to wear pants. Mm. That was kind of interesting. Right, right. So that's interesting. You can have a dress code, but you can't make the gender distinctions. And that completely overturns the traditional dress code. So then the employers just said, oh, forget it, you know, dress appropriately. I think we had one more comment here, and then I think we run out of time, but Benita Mehta said, among the younger generation, at least in the U.S., there is a move towards slow fashion and shopping at thrift stores, which is, which is very interesting. Among a certain percentage of the younger generation, there is also a giant percentage of that exact same generation that has made Shein the most successful brand on the planet. So, like, don't, don't, <laughs> don't give them all credit. <laughs> don't go over Right, right. That, that's really interesting. The, the rise of thrifting as, you know, I mean, when, when I was a young person, we went thrifting too, so it's not new, but it's certainly become a lot more widespread among people who are, I don't know, they're not trying to be edgy the way we were when I was a kid, you know, like thrifting was the edgy thing to do. Now it's just like, it's what they do. Um, and and I think, yeah, like resale and resale, I think is about to become an enormous secondary stream for every fashion house and every mm. luxury brand. You know, I think it's really going to be part of how they do business and sell their products mm. in the future. I give it like five years and then I bet every brand does their own resale. Wow. Oh, that's fascinating. And that relates to the high prices too, because you can justify higher price if the people can, you know, resell. Um, it's it's going to hold its value. Wow. So hold on to your handbags. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've run out of time, but we wanted to thank you both so much for, for, for sharing um, your time and your, on the, the discussion on, on, on Richard's book. And um, we look forward to all of us. I hope we're going to purchase it. And we look forward to reading it and, and following you in, both in the future. Everyone should read it. It's excellent. <laughs> Can't wait. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks so much. And thank you, Vanessa, for coming to talk to me. This was, it's always a pleasure. Me too. Nice to see everyone. Bye-bye.